Jesus Christ, what's going on, Deacon Hill? How y'all doing this morning? Thanks for coming out and worshiping with us. My name is Michael. I have the privilege of serving as the pastor of this wonderful fellowship of believers. If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for joining us, whether or not it's in person or online. And I always say, I don't know which camera is where, but thank you very much. Where we at? Thank you for coming out and worshiping with us. If you would do me a favor, if you're online, there might be a little button, but you can click message. Just send me uh, your name and phone number. If you're online uh, in person today, just send it to me on our Facebook page or whatever. Why? Because I would personally like to thank you, call you, and thank you for worshiping with us this morning here at Beacon Hill. At Beacon Hill, we're just a bunch of imperfect people serving a perfect God. We <laughs> desire to grow to look more like Jesus every single day. And if that is you, and that's what you desire to do, welcome to Beacon Hill Church. Amen? So, man, we're so thankful that you're here. Um, Look, um, this morning we are getting into one of the toughest passages that I could ever preach. Uh, we don't skip the hard stuff here at Beacon Hill. You're, you're coming here for the first time, you're hearing me for the first time. Uh, you have come on a doozy of a day. Uh, and we're going to hit what I believe is one of the toughest chapters in all the New Testament. So ladies and gentlemen, it's preaching time. If you would go ahead and grab your Bibles, open them up with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, where we will be studying verses 1 through 10 this morning. We don't have a copy of God's Word. The words will be coming up on the screen. We also have Bibles out there you can have. Go to BibleGateway.com. Download the new version of the Bible. How do you get there? However, you find a copy of God's Word, get God's Word in your hand. Uh, we believe here at Beacon Hill, it's not the words of me that will change your life, but the Word of God who can change anybody's life. So we encourage you to keep the Word of God open as I preach. If you would like a copy of today's sermon manuscript, all you have to do is send me a message, and uh, we will put you on an email address. If you're a member, you already have that on the member Facebook page. It is a PDF version of it. It goes up on Friday, so you can study. And I know y'all all studied ahead. I know y'all already read it. You already know it, because that's just the type of people you are, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. But if you want a copy, let us know, and we'll do that. Just send us a, a message. If you're able, please stand and honor our reading God's Word this morning. Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. I ask then, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. For I too am an Israelite of the descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or don't you know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I... I am the only one left, and they're trying to take my life. But what was God's answer to him? I have left 7,000 for myself who have not bowed down to Baal. In the same way, then there is also at the present time a remnant chosen by grace. Now if by grace, then it is not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. What then? Israel did not find what it was looking for, but the elect did find it. The rest were hardened as it was written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that cannot see, and ears that cannot hear to this day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a pitfall and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and their backs be bent continually. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for your word. I thank you for the Holy Spirit, of which we couldn't understand your word without it. So, Lord, I thank you for that. And, Lord, I pray this morning if someone is going through here and, and doesn't understand a, a lick of what I'm saying today, Lord, I pray that they would just seek you and allow the Holy Spirit just to intercede for them. So, Lord, I pray that if someone is here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, I, I pray that they would cry out to you. Lord, your word says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, not I'll get around to it, I'm going to have a good time and then make a deathbed confession. Your word says Today is the day of salvation. So, Lord, I pray if someone is underneath the sound of my voice right now that doesn't know you, today would be the day of salvation for them. May I decrease and you increase and you get all the glory now. In Jesus' holy precious name we praise you. Amen. You may be seated. I have entitled today's message, Is There Still Hope? Is There Still Hope? I, I mentioned that this is a tough passage. Uh, as we started going into Romans 9 through 11, I mentioned that, that this section of Scripture is one of the toughest passages in all of the Bible. And so you think Romans 9, Romans 10, and Romans 11, which, by the way, y'all have dug in and desired to grow deeper and, and deeper into this. But if you think about those three chapters, one of which 
has to be the toughest chapter of them all, right? Well, guess what? We are embarking on that chapter today, Romans chapter 11. So this is arguably the toughest chapter to preach in all the Bible. In fact, I would rather preach on a rabbit chewing its own cud in Leviticus than preach Romans chapter 11. But here we are, church, all right? I read a story about a pastor who was working his way through Romans, and he got to Romans chapter 11, and he stood up in front of the church and says, i got to be honest with you, I have no clue what this is about and how it is relevant to the church today. And since we have VBS and student camp this week, we're going to spend this entire hour praying over those two camps. And, you know, that's not how we roll here at Beacon Hill. We don't skip over the tough stuff. Plus, uh, we don't have VPS and student camps thanks to Corona, so that excuse is out the window. All right? It works for him, not for us. So why is this so tough? It's so tough because this passage deals with Israel's rejection of the Messiah. Jews' rejection of their Messiah. And if we look at this as Gentiles, the people who are not Jews, you would think, what does this have to do with us? You can see why a pastor would have a hard time trying to find this applicable to the church that they preach. Matter of fact, one commentator who I love, and uh, who I love dearly, and who has taught me so much over the years, has said that this chapter should not be applied to the church today because it deals strictly with the future of Israel. While I agree that this chapter deals with the future of Israel, I disagree that this chapter cannot be applied to the church today. So with God's help, we're going to pull out some truths in this 10 verses that can help us be the church that God is calling us to be. Remember, Paul is writing this letter to the church at Rome to, to garner support, to take the gospel to Spain where it had never been before. And they, when he's doing this, the, the people have some questions that, that are coming up, and he knows that they have questions. And so they were like, I thought that the Jews were God's chosen people. And yet, Paul, you're telling me only a remnant of the Jews are actually going to be saved. And even those who have all the knowledge, some of them are going to actually turn away and rebel against God. They had questions. They were, they were confused by this. And as a Jew, it can get pretty discouraging to hear. They could feel hopeless and say, what is the point? I thought we were God's chosen people, yet... Is he turning his back on us? Is he, is he not fulfilling his promises? It, it, and if God did that, if God turned away from the Jews and did fulfill his promises, what could he do for us? What does that mean for us in the church today? And i got to tell you, that is like how Satan likes to get into our minds. How Satan tries to twist God's word. you you got to know that, that Satan knows God's word. And he tries to twist it and pervert it to the hearers. We must remember when we get into the Word of God, the overarching theme of the Bible, the Bible that I hold in my hand, this is God's love story, church. This is God's love story about the very people that He created yet rebelled against Him. Yet, He did not give up on them. He did the only thing that He could do when there was no hope, when we were all hopeless. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, down from heaven to live the perfect life, to die on the cross of Calvary, who conquered the grave, so that whosoever shall believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Y'all, I'm here today to tell you that when you think life is hopeless, you look no further than the cross to see the meaning of hope. I thought a couple more people would be excited about that this morning, but look, I brought my own witness, all right? <laughs> Quite frankly, we live in a time when it feels kind of hopeless, right? We live in a time, I'm not talking about COVID-19, I'm not talking about chinchillas or enchiladas or earthquakes or fire ants, I'm not talking about dust storms, I'm not talking about hurricanes, which by the way, it is pretty impressive. That two are going to hit at the same time this week. 2020 just keeps giving, doesn't it? But when I'm talking about that, that alone, when we look at the things in this world, is enough to encourage us. But what I'm talking about this morning, I'm talking about the rising tension among the nations. The tension between Russia, we see China and North Korea. It wasn't that long ago, church, that we thought Iran and Iraq were our biggest threats. I'm talking about the divide amongst political parties that has torn this country apart. I'm talking about the racial tension that is going on in this country. I'm talking about three times as many people 
who will be aborted this year and who will die from COVID-19. I'm talking, y'all, y'all with me this morning? Look, I'm talking about a spiraling drug problem in which Hopewell is considered the opioid capital of the East Coast, where there are more gunshots ringing out in Hopewell than church bells. Look, this morning, I want you to know that I'm talking about broken homes, broken marriages, loss of jobs. If you look around, you can be tempted to think that we are without hope and that Satan is winning the war. But Paul is saying in this passage, don't ever count out God. Don't ever count out Jesus. No matter how hopeless the situation looks, God has not lost the battle for humanity. While this chapter is speaking to the Israel, we can pull out of this the hope that we have in the church today. Look, I hope God never gives up on Israel. Has he given up on them because of the rejection of Jesus? I hope not. But Paul is showing them. And in the process, showing us God is still working, even when we feel like he's not. We see in Scripture this morning first, the reason why we still have hope Amen. is that you are living proof yeah. that it's still hope. Verse 1, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. See, Paul is saying, I, I am living proof that God has not given up on his people. Paul says, I am an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Yet he is saying basically that I have all the pedigree, but I was one of the ones who was rebelling against God. If you don't know the story of Paul, he was once one of the biggest opponents to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was terrorizing Christians. He was killing them, dragging them to prison. And yet, if there is anybody who would ever think that God would give up on them, it was Paul. If God gives up on his people, then Paul would have been example one. Yet, he is example one that God does not give up. He went from a terrorist to an evangelist, church. He went from an unbeliever to an apostle. He went from a host of the gospel of Jesus Christ to one of the best messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has ever walked this earth. Paul is saying, I am living proof that there is still hope. Look, Paul says, you can look at who I used to be, and you can look at who I am now. And I don't know if I have a witness in here this morning, but you can sit there and say, thank God I am not who I used to be. And Christ Jesus has changed me, produced me to who I am today. That God has not given up. That you are proof that God is not silent. So don't mistake the silence of God with the inactivity of God. Because God is always working, church. In the midst of the chaos all around us, we have seen children come to Christ. We have seen senior citizens come to Christ. We have seen drug dealers come to Christ. People choosing Jesus over drugs. You need to look no further than your own testimony to see that there is still hope. You are a living proof. Y'all have fun yet this morning? I need to bring some tea up on stage or something from now on. Let me get to my second point. There is hope in the hopelessness. Verses 2 through 4. God has not rejected his people, whom he for you. Or don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I, I am the only one left, and they're trying to take my life. But what God's answer to him, I have left 7,000 for myself who have not bowed down to bow. This is the most awesome son-in-law that I have. <laughs> Read the story. I got one that wants to be my son-in-law. That's another story. All right, here we go. <laughs> Read the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19. This is a homework assignment for you. Seriously, read 1 Kings 19. Why is it a homework assignment for you? One, we're talking about in this passage. Two, as God would have it, Nigel is going to preach on this exact passage in two weeks. We do not make this stuff up. We just preach through books of the Bible, and Nigel will sit there like, are you kidding me? This is the exact passage that I am preaching in two weeks that God is referencing here in Romans. Look, after a great victory against the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, Elijah went through a great bout of depression. And that's a sermon in itself. Like a lot of us, 
A lot of us on the outside, we appear to have it all together, don't we? But on the inside, we're fighting the battle of our lives. We like to, to put on a shell on the outside because we don't want people to know what's happening in our life. You know what I'm saying this morning? See, we can look like we're on the mountaintops when our, when our souls are in the valley. As God would have it, we sit here and, and see that Elijah, he, he was afraid uh, of what was happening. He was afraid of this wicked woman named Jezebel who threatened to kill him. And he did what any man would do when faced with an angry woman. He ran. He ran as fast as he could. He ran hundreds of miles away into a cave on Mount Horan. Having won the battle, he was now facing the prospects of losing his own life. He thinks they will come and find him because he humiliated the prophets of Baal. And this is my favorite part in the passage. Turn to 1 Kings 19, 9 if you have your Bibles open. While he was hiding, the Lord asked him a simple question. The Lord came and found him in the cave and he goes, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Now Elijah goes into excuse mode. You, you ever made excuses to God? You ever start making up excuses for your actions to God? Yeah. He's like, Lord, you don't understand, God. You don't understand. Like, yeah, God's like, yeah, I didn't understand. This took me all by surprise. I never saw this coming. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? Like God knows everything that's going to happen in your life. Nothing takes him by surprise. But in the moment when you're running and you're, and you're in fear for your life and when you're going through all these things, and you feel like God doesn't know what's going on, you feel like, like God doesn't, it, it isn't with you, Yet, yet here we are. You feel like you're the only one going through what you're going through. Elijah says, they have rejected the covenant. They're tearing down the altars. They're killing prophets. And now I'm running for my life. What do you mean, God? What do you mean, what am I doing here? I think it's pretty obvious what I'm doing here, God. God is like, really? Like, really? You think you're the only one left? You think you're the only one left? And so you're hiding in a cave. God says, I I've raised up. 7,000 in Israel for myself who have not bowed down to Baal. See, this happens to us when we think that we're the only ones going through what we're going through. This happens to us when we think that we're the only ones who are serving the Lord. See, I always love Jonathan Edwards' two resolutions. He said, I will serve the Lord, and if no one else does, I still will. There's a lot of great wisdom in those resolutions. But the fact of the matter is, there will never be a time in your life where you're the only one who is serving the Lord. There will never be a time in your life where you're the only one going through what you're going through. So when you think that you're the only Christian at work, when you think you're the only believer in your family, when you think you're the only Christian in your school, when you're the only one going through what you're going through, I want you to know that God is bigger than you. God is bigger than your problems. Don't have a small view of a big God. So when you feel hopeless, Look to the author of hope, but his name is Jesus. Don't let Satan convince you that you're Tom Hanks with a volleyball on a deserted island. You are not alone. You are not without hope. In the bar of phrase for the late Johnny Oates, you might feel at the end of your rope, but you are never at the end of your hope in Christ Jesus. God's grace is hope enough. Verses 5 through 6. In the same way then, there's also at the present time a remnant chosen by grace. Now it's by grace that it's not by works, otherwise grace ceases to be grace. You want to get to the core of this message? Has God given up on Israel? Absolutely not. You know, there are more Jewish Christians in this world now than at any point in time in history. It may be small, but they are more than ever before. And it's only by God's grace that that has happened, church. You know, we look at, we started this church out of our living room where we have Bible studies on Tuesday night. It's only by God's grace that it has grown to where it is now. God has been more gracious to Beacon Hill than we deserve, amen? amen. We, we, we have churches that, that are partners with us and not competitors. You know, just uh, last week we had a church, a church that has an older congregation that, that can't get out and do missions anymore, but they still have a heart for Jesus. And they saw what we're doing here in the well, and they voted as a church to send us a check for $200 a month to support and partner in our mission to help the homeless and those in need here. And we call ourselves 
hope dealers. We are hope dealers here. And I love doing that because there's so many other dealers here in the well, but I got good news for you. We're not the only hope dealers here. There are other churches that are fighting back against drugs here in the well. And we are happy to partner with them in our mission so that not only are drugs taken off the streets, but we see more drug dealers actually come to Christ and witnessing him. Look, don't, don't ever minimize small beginnings, church. A trickle can turn into a stream, a stream can turn into a river, and a river can turn into a flood, and I believe God can use this trickle to flood this entire town with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you with this Let me give you three takeaways. Let me give you three takeaways. One, walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith and not by sight. Because when you look around in this world, you can get easily discouraged. And it used to be, man, that CNN and Fox News would discourage you enough, but I think Facebook has taken that title. <laughs> Facebook can discourage you and just make you want to give up on humanity. And it just shows us, don't put your faith in what you see, but what you know. Then God says that I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He meant it, and you can count on it, church. So as much as we see all this stuff going on in this world today, we know who wins in the end, and his name is Jesus Christ. Secondly, to take home with you, is that God is never without a witness. God is never without a witness. When I went on my first mission trip, I was told to go find the person of peace. Not like there are 500,000 people in this country, and you tell me that I have to find a person of peace? Like, you've got to be kidding me. And I don't even speak the same language. And I've told this story time and time again, that God brought me a person of peace. I want to encourage you. Don't ever think that you're all alone. Sometimes you just got to open your eyes and God will bring somebody right to you to let you know that you are not alone in this battle. Someone will bring you and walk with you. I was in the middle of the woods at this battalion yesterday. A guy walked out the freaking woods and started talking about Jesus with me. You never know. But you can know that you're never alone. You're never alone, church. But I want you to know this very important point because I think so many times that we're looking for somebody else to encourage us, you've got to realize that sometimes you're the one that needs to encourage others. You, you, you are sometimes the only Bible that people will ever read. When I went to Martinique, I was looking for a specific people group. Like out of hundreds of thousands of people, there was only a river. Look at this, man. A whole gold piece. That's awesome, man. I didn't see that come here. Thank you so much. I was over there. A hundred and thousand people. I have been called to actually work with the English speaking people of Martinique. These are people that had had uh, come from from overseas and had settled in Martinique. And so I looked, I looked all day long for them, and it's it's hot. And so it was right at night time. It was right at night time when we had given up. We hadn't found a single person all day that basically who speaks English or, or is trying to learn English. And we're looking for them. And I mean, it's like, it's, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And we were about to give up. So we went down to the pool for like a 9 o'clock, a 9 o'clock, just to dip in the pool to relax and unwind and, and strategize for the next day. And as I was going to the pool, Royce, who was with me, he stopped and started talking to someone. He was the only person that spoke any French. And he started talking to the guy. And he said, Michael, you, you might want to come over here. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? The guy said, uh, yeah, we're, we're with the English-speaking uh, association of, of Martinique. Like there's an association of the people we're looking for. We're here and we're meeting at the pool tonight because our reservations got changed and this is the only place they had for us. And we looked around, there's 25 people that God brought to the pool that we were about to give up. And I sat there. I was like, you got to be kidding me. They said, do you want to join us? I'm like, heck yeah. And we find out these 25 people were all atheists. They're all atheists. They, they don't even believe that God exists. And here we are, that God is bringing them right to us. 
And so we're sitting there and we're going around that in this meeting they are forced to actually only speak English. And we're going around introducing ourselves and having to say why we are there. And I sat there and I said to them, when I came to I said, I'm Michael Moore, you know, I'm from Chester, Virginia, and God sent me here to speak to you. And they didn't know, they didn't understand, they didn't believe in God. I'm like, no, and I told them the story. I said, God sent me here to speak to the English-speaking people of Mark Nick, and here you are. And they said, look, the leader who could have shut me down, he says, you've got three minutes to tell us why we should believe in this God, that you came all the way here. And I preach Jesus for three minutes. I preach Jesus with everything I have. And I, if you know, if you preach Jesus, you're going to preach Jesus and Jesus crucified. And I preach the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at the end of those three minutes, two people stood up and said, I want to know more about this person that you just talked about. Was it a remnant? Was it, was it a remnant out of the 25? Yes. But those two people are worth it, isn't it? Those two people are worth it. So I'm asking you this morning, don't give up on God. I don't know what battle you're going through, what, what you're facing, what you're about to just throw in the towel on. I'm telling you, don't give up on God because he's never given up on you. So I don't know what, what story you have. I don't know what your testimony is, but I can tell you that your pain can be used for someone else's gain. And their game is to come to Jesus Christ and Lord their lives. So I don't know what you've got going on this morning, but the altar's open. You can pray, you can kneel, you can pray. If you need me, uh, we can pray and talk. Whatever's going on in your heart. If you've never given your life to Jesus, then I pray that you would do that now. And today would be the day of salvation for them. If you don't know how, that's what we're here for here. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to smile. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for who you are. I thank you for being a God who never gives up. A God who keeps running after us every single day, who never gives up. Lord, even when we hide in the valleys, even when we hide in the caves, when we cry out, you are there. You are there. We don't need to come to a church building to find you. You go to where we are and meet us there and point us to yourself. Lord, I'm thankful for the hope that is in Christ Jesus. I'm thankful this morning that, that this message has pierced somebody's soul because I know that your word says that it will not return void. So, Lord, I pray right now that somebody right now is having the courage to sit there and say, you know what? I was about to give up hope. I was about to throw in the towel. But I know that God loves me. I know that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. And I'm going to cling tighter to him than I ever have and release my hold on the things of this world. I choose to walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Please stand and respond as the Lord be.